In the primitive politics of the underseas world, many forms of life long ago learned that survival depended on the common strategy of the species. Under attack, this cohesive community of strangers can explode in all directions like a golden grenade, distracting predators from zeroing in on a single victim. Other species have learned to gather in massively efficient hunting packs in their constant scouring of the sea for the food of life. And still other creatures learn that only by mobilizing in vast multitudes can they perpetuate their unknown destinies by giving life to unborn generations. April 2nd, entry in the logbook of Calypso by Captain Jacques Cousteau. Yesterday evening, when the launch crew was preparing one of our mini-subs for a test dive, they spotted a school of 40 to 50 sea owl squid alongside Calypso. It's the first time we've seen squid since we entered California coastal waters. All on board have long become alert to the unexpected ways of oceanic life. So our curiosity is suddenly quickened by the sight of several hundred of the sea jets. A crewman reflexively moves to lower another sea light deeper into the dark waters, oblivious to the dangerous presence of prowling blue sharks. Thousands and hundreds of thousands of the translucent phantoms suddenly well up from the depths like a living tide, until Calypso is virtually ensnared in the Sargasso Sea of Squid. It is the beginning of the Night of the Squid. Head mini-sub pilot Albert Falco gladly welcomes the unexpected massing of the CRO squid. They will provide a night dive with a spectacular opportunity to test the mini-sub's new narrow beam camera lights. And Calypso's always enterprising chef also take immediate advantage of this rare sea bonanza. Never before in his life have such delicacies fairly leapt into his versatile skillets. At exactly 4.15 a.m., the mini-sub is swung out over the sea of squid. Falco reports by telephone that all systems are go and that he is ready to fly. Jacques Delcouter disconnects the nylon safety line and the communications cable. And alone with his own thoughts, the intrepid Falco starts the mini-sub down. He is about to enter for the first time into that theatrical, near hallucinatory instant of time, which we will soon learn is the CRO's ancestral convocation of life and death.
depth of nearly a hundred feet, hovering just above the bottom. Falco begins to describe his observations from within the sub. Suddenly, he cuts his narrative short to report he has lost all power in his propulsion motors. Gaston cautiously advises Falco to immediately shut down all unessential power drains, even though the mini-subs have independent life support and communication systems adequate for 24 hours. Falco, in turn, advises Topside he is about to manually release the sub's cast iron ballast and proceed to the surface. Instinctively, the recovery launch operator moves to within a few yards of where he estimates the mini-sub will emerge. Gaston informs Falco that immediately upon surfacing, the recovery launch will take the mini-sub in tow. Falco again acknowledges. The recovery operation is always a busy affair. The surfacing mini-sub, the noisy lounge, our divers and camera lights should frighten the squid away. Instead, untold numbers of these spectral-like creatures continue to materialize around Calypso, as if by sea magic. Safely aboard Calypso, all thoughts of the malfunction of the sub's motors are put aside by the divers. Little in their long experience beneath the sea can compare with what they have seen tonight. André Laban is the first to discover a clue to explain the incredible gathering of the sea arrows and their quixotic behavior. Stuck to the sub's hull is a small clutch of sea arrow egg cases. By sheer chance, Calypso has anchored over one of the secret spawning grounds of the elusive sea arrow squid. Immediately, a radio alert is put out for Captain Cousteau, who is ashore on ship's business. Then a camera team prepares to film the pre-dawn underwater spectacle of the Sea Arrows mating dance. Wary of the mindless but unpredictable blue sharks, the divers move out with billies at the ready. An accidental collision with a blue in the confusion of the squid strobe night waters could cause a serious injury. With professional detachment, the camera team executes a final equipment and buddy check, and then they dive. Possible for our divers to approach these normally shy and fugitive creatures, even within camera range. But now, with their single life's moment of mass mating but a few hours away, they are completely oblivious to the intruders. Amazingly, the divers can actually touch them. Even an unflappable mola mola fish seems to adopt the uncharacteristic behavior of the squids. It is as though an entire generation of sea arrows is aware that their moment of truth has arrived. The 
divers have never before observed the unique courtship antics of the sea arrows. They begin to collect specimens for observation in the Calypso Aquarium. So involved are the squid in their undulating preamble to the supreme biological act of their lives, they appear to be totally oblivious to all else. As the divers ascend, it is like moving through the strange underwater cyclotron, a glow with flying particles of organic energy. As divers return to Calypso with the first specimens of sea arrows, they know from long experience what lies ahead. All of us on board have become observers of the behavior of life in the sea. As such, we are necessarily opportunists. No matter what our planned destination or objective may be, we are prepared at any time to change, to take immediate advantage of whatever unforeseen opportunities the sea presents in her own unfathomable way. <laughs> As the specimen squid are transferred to the ship's aquarium, they revert for a split second to sea form. In the calm of topside, the divers can now observe in detail the sea arrow's inky decoys and his pulsing jet power. <laughs> But in the ship's galley, the irrepressible Remo Amadio has only thoughts of several hundred untried variations in the preparation of squid Provençal. It is the one dimension of the sea arrow adventure which the men and divers of Calypso will come to look upon with some lack of relish. <laughs> April 3rd, entry in the log book of Calypso by Captain Gusto. At 8.40 this morning, I arrived by seaplane at the anchorage of Calypso, near an offshore island of the Southern California coastline. I was anxious to obtain from Falco and the divers detailed eyewitness accounts of their initial encounter with the sea owl spawning migration. I was also eager to set into action a plan I developed on the plane to film, for the first time in the wild, the complete procreation cycle of the sea owl squids. Bonjour, Cousteau is immediately advised by the ship's captain that the nearby availability of provisions will permit the ship to remain anchored where it is for an indefinite period of time. Cousteau is then shown the cause of the mini-sub's loss of motor power during its pre-dawn dive. Squid sucked into the intakes of the sub's water jets had forced the electric motors to overload to a fuse blowing level. Next, Cousteau holds a conference with crew leaders to outline his plan for round-the-clock filming and television monitoring of the spawning activities. Calypso comes alive with action. Cameras and diving gear are checked out with an eye to a unique opportunity to obtain a rare film document for the study of marine biologists concerned with the reduction of squid stocks in some of the world fisheries. Most of the 350 living varieties of the squid family constitute a vital link in the underseas food chain. Many open ocean fish and sea mammals depend heavily and sometimes exclusively on squid as their food staple. Over harvesting the squid may cause many irreversible changes in the ecology of the sea. 
and I cannot help figuring out the terrible damage a single net haul could do here as the critical mating begins. By 8 p.m., the sea arrows, sensitive to the ultraviolet rays of sunlight, have returned to the upper waters. Courtship has ended and mating has begun, foreshadowing 72 consecutive hours of violence, life, and desperation. Cousteau then urges the divers to strive for individual close-ups of the mating action, an almost impossible task in the swirling storm of squid. In the communication shack, the deep water mating of the sea arrows is already under the observation of a TV monitoring team. Suddenly, with little warning, Calypso is plunged into darkness. Rene Rabino, the ship's engineer, moves quickly to discover the source of the power generator failure. With the experience of the mini-sub's luckless dive the preceding night in mind, he first checks the seawater intake filter of the generator's circulation pump. A short dozen, or a little more than two pounds, of sea arrow gremlins has brought the total operation of the 360-ton Calypso to a complete standstill. Ah, okay. Okay. With the marine engineer's silently begrudging salute to the omnipresent squids, Rabino proceeds to restore the ship's power supply. Our divers move quickly to examine the generator pump intake screens located on the underside of Calypso's hull. Their purpose is to make recommendations to the ship's engineer. He will improvise a device to prevent a repetition of the incident. Loss of power would mean our filming of the squid at night would be interrupted. A returning diver shows in a way most natural to him the insidiousness of the sea arrow squids, a slippery, insinuating capability which has already paralyzed the mini sub and darkened Calypso. <laughs> At 9 p.m., Cousteau gives the go-ahead to commence filming. Before the night is over, the eight divers will spend an aggregate of 16 hours in the swirling maelstrom of the mating squids. They will shoot one mile of film and consume 36 tanks of compressed air. And in the darkness of the sea, they will be witness to sudden death. Ordinarily, squids move and maneuver by the use of swimming fins located on the sides of their fusiform bodies. Their instantaneous jet propulsion potential is mainly used when chasing food or escaping enemies. The males, however, also use jet action in the mating process to fiercely compete for egg-ripe females. to females, all an average age of three years, is nearly one to one. But in the mating melee, there is no pairing of the sexes. Mating is entirely polygamous and troilism is common. Often, in the abandoned frenzy, frantic males will mistakenly attempt to couple with other males. This often leads to indignant violence. Camouflage, 
All squid have the capability to change their color to many exquisite hues. Therefore, one of the most striking manifestations of the mating act is the blushing of the males. At his greatest point of excitement, waves of maroon sweep over his head and arms until he releases the female from his urgent embrace. One hundred and ten feet down, the burgeoning females have already begun to litter the seafloor with gelatinous egg cases. During the next three days, every female will lay ten to twenty cylindrical egg capsules, each containing on the average one hundred individual eggs. To prevent sea currents from carrying the egg cases away from the temperate waters, the females painstakingly anchor the sticky filament of each capsule to sea flora, or bottom outcroppings. Ordinarily, most of the fastidious females arrange their egg strands into communal bouquets, resembling buoyant sea chrysanthemums. During their strenuous labors, the females continue to welcome the attentions of males. For even if the males spill their adhesive milk in the water flowing around the egg clusters, the sperm will penetrate the still soft capsules, and the mystery of life will begin. Having reached the limits of their diving time, the camera teams are forced to call it a night. As they slowly move up through the darkness to their first decompression level, they intuitively sense the shadowy presence of death. Perhaps attracted by the grappling of the mating squid as they are by the helpless thrashing of wounded sea animals, the sharks move in. Normally, the jet-propelled squids are among the fastest creatures in the sea, and for their size, certainly the most elusive. What a lamentable irony that they fall victims to jackals of the sea at the precise moment they join in vulnerable life-producing embrace. Confident that the feeding sharks are safely preoccupied, the divers surface. Momentarily, they are cut off from the carnage below. At that instant, the unpredictable happens. A 12-foot, tooth-studded blue arcs widely in his pass at the mating squid, forcefully reminding the divers that they too are frail strangers in his domain. <laughs> 